As she made her way to Jesus, she stumbled through the tears that made her blind. She felt such pain, some spoke in anger. She heard folks whisper, there's no place here for her kind. Still on she came through the shame that flushed her face until at last she knelt before his feet. And though she spoke no word, everything she said was heard as she From her box of alabaster And I've come to pour My praise on him Like oil From Mary's alabaster box Don't be angry If I wash his feet with my tears And dry them with my had me bound. I spent my days and I poured my life without measure into a little treasure box I thought I had found. Until the day when Jesus came to me and filled my soul with the wonder of chapter 23 in our Bibles this morning. We all know by this time that just outside the wall of Jerusalem was a road that wound around the city. And there by that road where those who were passing by could watch and in clear view of the city's wall, the Romans would crucify those who were slated for the ugliest of deaths. A death that was designed to make death as slow and as painful 
as possible. And just behind that place of crucifixion was a rocky cliff formed by the quarrying out of rock that had the look of a skull upon its face. It was a well-known place here where the Romans executed their criminals. In the Greek, it was called cranium. In the Hebrew, it was called Golgotha. In Latin, the name is Calvary. There they took Jesus on that most eventful of days. And there God's best met man's worst. Everything that happened that day is so deeply significant. And perhaps nothing is more significant than the words that fell from Jesus' lips during those hours of agony. Jesus uttered seven sayings or seven phrases there that day. Some of them are recorded in the Gospel of Luke. Some of them are recorded in the Gospel of John. One of them is recorded only in Matthew and in Mark. But when you take the gospel stories and you begin to study the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and you weave together the parts of the story that God used each gospel writer to record, you can easily put together the, the way the day progressed and the statements that Jesus Christ made as he hung on the cross. They nailed him to the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning. In their way of reckoning time, it was the third hour of the day. And Jesus Christ, between 9 in the morning and 12 noon, was mocked and ridiculed and, and said three things. He said, Father, forgive them. He said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And he said, woman, behold thy son. Three simple statements, each pointed to others around him. Then something happened at noon. All of a sudden, the world grew dark. An eerie midnight darkness engulfed the city of Jerusalem and the land of Israel. The darkness was throughout the land the Bible tells us. And for three hours, there's no record of anything that was said by anyone around the cross or Jesus hanging on the cross. As best we can tell, for three hours, Jesus hung in an eerie darkness without saying a word, just suffering. As I mentioned, I believe last week, due to the presence of children, I will go into detail about what physically happened during those hours to Jesus Christ, what he was enduring and going through physically as a result of crucifixion. But those were horrendous hours of agonizing suffering and pain just to get one gasp of air was horrendous. And from 12 noon till 3 in the afternoon, Jesus hung there on the cross, gasping for breath, suffering. And then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it was the ninth hour of the day, according to the reckoning given by the Jewish reckoning of time. And as it's recorded in the text we read just a moment ago, In the the ninth hour of the day, three o'clock in the afternoon, the silence was broken with with a cry from Jesus Christ. And then in what appears to be in rapid succession, Jesus Christ uttered his final four sayings. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried out, I thirst. He cried out, it's finished. 
And he cried up to God. Into thy hands. I commend my spirit. And his head. Fell to his chest. And he was gone. Seven statements. That Jesus Christ. Said. Do you understand what Jesus was expressing in these seven phrases? We know that last words are important. We have read stories of last words. We, we know that there are times when last words are extremely profound as a person slips out of life and into eternity. Understanding what Jesus Christ had on his heart and what he said can be life changing. To get into the head of Jesus Christ and understand what he was thinking, and what he commented on as he hung on the cross are powerful. So, in your little worksheet this morning, I've divided the statements into the first three hours from nine to noon, and then the final hour at three in the afternoon. Now I want us to think just for a few moments about what was so important to Jesus Christ that in these hours of his agony, he would break his silence and he would speak. And I want us to learn some, some truths and valuable lessons from what he said. The first phrase that we read is, Recorded in Luke's gospel in Luke chapter 23 in verse number 34. Then said Jesus, Father. By the way, the first, the middle, and the last statements all were addressed to God. The first and the last addressed God as my father. The middle one was not addressed to God as his father. The middle one at three in the afternoon was a cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Fatherless for the first time in eternity. But at the beginning and at the end, he knew that God was his father and addressed him as such. The first one, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I phrase it this way for the sake of the sermon this morning. Jesus Christ lifted his heart and his eyes toward heaven. And he said, Father, postpone the judgment Hold back your wrath. The word translated here, forgive, is a word which means let go or leave or, or dismiss. It's as if Jesus Christ is saying, God, I, I, Father, I, I know that you're, what they're doing to me this day. That you no doubt are on the, 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 the brink of just... Unleashing your wrath and your judgment and sending them all to hell in an instant. But God, I'm asking you, Father, I'm asking you, postpone that judgment. Hold back that judgment. Don't judge them yet. Because they don't know what they're doing. They're not acting in full understanding of what is going on here today. They lack clarity. God, don't hold them accountable yet. God, forgive them. Dismiss your judgment. Push it away. Hold back. Postpone it. Because they don't know what they're doing. See, those at Jerusalem didn't understand what was unfolding. Soldiers had no clue who they were nailing to that cross. 
the Sanhedrin were so confused and lacked clarity. The crowds that just got caught up in the emotion, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus declares that they don't know what's going on. They don't understand what they're doing. And God, I'm asking you, Father, I'm asking you, postpone the judgment. Hold back your wrath. They don't know what they're doing. But Jesus Christ has a plan. He's trained a band of soul winners. He's going to tell them just to wait for the Holy Spirit to come in a few weeks. And then Peter's going to get up on the day of Pentecost. And he's going to preach to this same crowd of people that are around the cross. He's going to preach to the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin that are there. He's going to preach to the crowd that are crucifying him. Peter's going to preach to this same crowd. God, hold back your wrath. Postpone your judgment. They don't know, but I've got a plan. And so Jesus prays, Father, don't unleash your wrath just yet. Hold back your winds of fury. They don't understand. Give them time. Did God answer Jesus' prayer? Oh, yes, he did. He answered it in successive stages. We, we can trace the answer through the book, uh, the, the Gospels and the book of Acts. Yet, yet God did answer Jesus' prayer. He did postpone that judgment. He postponed it for the thief that was hanging beside him. Who was hurling insults and was blaspheming Christ. And was saying, if you really are, save yourself and us. And he didn't understand what he was saying. But he began to understand. He began to get it. He, he, he began to understand who Jesus Christ was. And God postponed his judgment on that thief for a few moments, for a few hours. That morning. And then that thief turned to the one hanging beside him. He said, I know you're going to enter your kingdom today. When you get there. Would you remember me? And Jesus' second phrase was the first stage of his answer to the first saying that was a prayer for God to hold back his judgment. And Jesus looked to that thief hanging beside him and he said, Paradise, with me today. And God's first increment of answer to Jesus Prayer for God to postpone judgment because people don't understand yet. And that man understood Jesus Christ said, today, oh, this is horrible what we're going through. This suffering is horrendous that we're enduring. But in just a few hours, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. And it's going to be glorious. And it's going to be peace and comfort and joy. As we enjoy paradise together today in just a few hours. God answered Jesus First phrase, which was a prayer in a second increment. As the soldiers divided up the belongings of Jesus Christ, Matthew records that, that after they divided up his garments, they sat and watched him. Interesting. The soldiers watched him. 
They've crucified hundreds of criminals before. What, what was significant about this one that they sat there and watched him? What was significant about this one that they studied what was going on that day? Why is this one different? Maybe, maybe it was hearing that cry. Oh, they were used to nailing bodies to crosses. And, and, and as, they, as they nailed bodies to crosses, those criminals would curse at the soldiers, would spit at them as they were nailing the nails through their flesh. They would spit at the soldiers. They would scream at them and curse them. They'd seen it a hundred times. They'd wipe the spit off their own faces a hundred of times. And they, would, they would give them a little bit of, a little bit of vinegar that, that would dull their pain. It was like a sedative. It, was, it would dull their pain so they, could, so they could hold them still enough to nail them to the cross. But when they gave this one vinegar, he wouldn't drink it. He didn't want any of his senses dulled. This one's different. They watched him. And instead of cursing at the soldiers and spitting at the soldiers, he kept crying out, Father, don't judge them yet. Don't judge them yet. They, they don't know what they're doing. And at the end of the day, when Jesus' head fell against his chest and he died, the centurion that had been watching all of this, we saw last week, he got it. He got it. Father, hold back your judgment. They don't get it yet. And then one got it, and a thief got saved. And then another got it, and a centurion got saved. And then a few weeks later, when Peter got up and preached that sermon on the day of Pentecost, I'll go back and read that sermon. He put it in the face of those people who crucified Christ. But he said, you did it in ignorance. Listen to Peter in Acts 3, 17. And now, brethren, I want that through ignorance ye did it, as did your rulers to the Jewish people and to the rulers of the people. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And 3,000 souls repented. 3,000 souls, 3, souls that had shouted out, crucify him, crucify him. 3,000 souls that Jesus prayed, Father, hold back your judgment. Postpone your judgment. Don't release your wrath yet. They don't understand yet. They're ignorant. And a few weeks later, 3,000 of them ushered into the kingdom of God, into paradise, the joy with the thief and with the centurion. Oh, yes. God answered Jesus' prayer to hold back his judgment for a time to give them time. But I've got to tell you, the winds of God's wrath are never held back indefinitely. It was only 40 years till Titus and the Roman armies would come in and crucify a million Jews on crosses as they conquered and destroyed Israel. And scattered them to the four corners of the earth. Yeah, that generation paid a price for crucifying the Messiah. But Jesus had begged his father not to do it today. Give them time. Hold back your judgment. Postpone your judgment. They don't understand. Give them time. And God answered the prayer Countless souls were ushered into God's kingdom. 
paradise. You know, we live in a time when God is holding back his winds of judgment on America. And, and, and maybe we should pray like Jesus did. God, would you postpone your judgment on America just a little bit longer? God, they don't know what they're doing. They're so ignorant of what they're doing. But sooner or later, God's patience wears out. In 2 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is a long-suffering God. He was on the day of Jesus' crucifixion. And his long-suffering resulted in countless people being born again. And he's long-suffering today. And as we give out tracts and share our testimony and witness to others and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and pray, God, don't judge. Don't judge yet. God, hold back your judgment. God, postpone your judgment for a little bit longer. They don't know what they're doing. But sooner or later, as it happened in the first century, God's judgment will finally be unleashed. America will be destroyed under the hand of God's wrath. But for now, He's postponing his judgment because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We have a limited sphere of golden opportunity as Israel had in the first century. But one day ours will end like Israel's ended. We have a golden opportunity. We have to take advantage of the opportunity while we have it. The first two statements, the first two sayings of the cross were directed to the salvation of souls. Were directed in God holding back his judgment that more might get saved. To give time for people to hear the gospel, understand the gospel, be impacted by the gospel. Be saved through the gospel. But then the third one is so different. The third one is not recorded in the gospel of Luke. It's recorded in the gospel of John. In John's gospel, in the 19th chapter, the four soldiers had crucif that crucified, it, there were four soldiers who were assigned to crucify a man. And one of the things that they were, uh, one of the ways they were paid for their services was that they took the clothing, the sandals, the, all the, the articles of clothing of the person who they were crucifying and they divided them up amongst themselves. Jesus Christ had, as best we can tell, what would have been very typical of a man in that day, that was five pieces of clothing, five items of clothing. There were four soldiers. They divided up the pieces of clothing and what was left over was one piece but it was a hand woven piece it, it had no seam in it. it it was it was woven as a one piece garment a tunic a vestment vesture and the soldiers said you know we could cut it up into four pieces and each of us have a piece of it but that'll destroy the garment Let's play dice, and we'll see who wins the fifth piece of clothing. Little did they know that they were fulfilling a prophecy from Psalm 22, where Psalm 22 says of the Messiah that they would divide up his, his garments, and then they would cast lots for his vestment. Little did they know they were fulfilling prophecy from Psalm 22 as they gambled that day and, and determined which one would have the garment. 
It seems, and, and this isn't clear in the Bible, it, but in studying the customs of the Jewish people, the clothing, and it, it, it seems that that hand-woven, seamless garment was probably made by his mom and probably given to him as often was when his son left the home to enter into his adulthood. If that's the case, then this last garment that's being gambled for was a garment that was woven by Mary and given to him just three years earlier when he left Nazareth and entered into his ministry. One of the things that suggests that that might be the case was that John links together the timing of the soldiers gambling for that garment and Jesus Christ seeing his mom there at the cross. John records that there were some women there at the cross in John chapter 19, verse number 24. In the middle of the verse says, They parted my garment for my vesture. They cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus. And there are four women mentioned. There was Jesus' mom. There was his mom's sister. Her name was Salome. There was another Mary who was the wife of a Cleophas. And then there was Mary Magdalene. Four precious women there at the cross. And it was when they gambled for his vesture that Jesus saw his mom. We don't know, it's just speculation, but many have speculated that when he saw them gambling for that article of clothing, his mind went back to his mom, weaving that for him, giving that to him. And he turned and he looked down and there was his mom with these three other ladies. By the way, one of those women was Mary Magdalene. When you go to Israel, you will no doubt visit Magdala, the city right there on the Sea of Galilee, just around the corner from Capernaum, where Jesus had his headquarters and where Peter's home was. And there in Magdala, there was a woman of a, a, a sordid, immoral lifestyle. Who Jesus Christ saved. Very possible that that was the woman that Hannah just sang about. But how much she loved Jesus Christ. Because of what he saved her from. The Bible tells us that he who is forgiven much loves much. If you don't think you're all that bad. You have no need to love Jesus very much at all. But if you know you, like God knows you, and you know how wicked you are, and you know how despicable you are, and you know how sinful you are, and then you experience Jesus Christ's love, washing all that sin away by grace and mercy, you love him much. If you know how much he forgave you of. And when that saved woman slipped in to that home where Jesus was dining with the Pharisees. And broke that alabaster box that contained a very precious ointment. Likely purchased with the money she earned 
through a life of immorality. It was the treasure of her life. But Jesus Christ had saved her and changed her. And she broke that alabaster box. And she poured out the contents on Jesus Christ. And she wiped his feet with her hair. And she wept. And the Pharisee says, what, what right does a woman like that have in our home? She's at the cross now with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And Jesus Christ looks down and sees his mom and these other amazing ladies at the cross. And in Jesus' third phrase, Jesus Christ fulfilled his final earthly family responsibility. See, many in our Western culture have lost the sense of this great responsibility. We've allowed the government to encroach into family responsibilities. We pay the taxes and expect the government to manage our family responsibilities. Like raising our kids. That's why Western culture is demanding free child care from birth so they don't have to raise their kids. Educating our kids. How's it going, Loudoun County, with the government educating your kids? How do you like what they're being taught? How do you like how they're being groomed to be immoral people in their childhood? And taking care of their elderly. God outlined the responsibilities of a family. He outlined the responsibilities of a government. And we've allowed government to take over the responsibility that God never gave to a government. And we've allowed the government to take over responsibilities that God did give under command to families. Jesus will have none of that. Jesus will fulfill his final responsibility to his mom. Jesus lived to a higher standard. He knew he was the one responsible to make sure his mom was cared for after he died. In his own word, in the Old Testament, he instructed children to honor their parents all the way to the grave. He repeated it in the New Testament. The children are to honor their fathers and their mothers. Take care of them. Honor them doesn't just mean tip the hat to them. It means take care of them. Jesus will not let the government take care of his mom. He will take care of his mom. That's his responsibility. In the pastoral epistles, those are New Testament letters that God wrote to pastors to teach them how to pastor the churches they pastored. So we call them the pastoral epistles. In one of those letters that God sent to a pastor, God told the pastor to make sure he instructs the church to have their families take care of their elderly. However, he said, if, they, if you have elderly people that don't have any family, if they don't have any family, then he said that the church should take care of those elderly people. But the church is not to take care of those elderly people so long as the elderly people have family. Don't encroach on the responsibilities of the family. Be a safe net if there is no family, but don't encroach 
into the responsibilities of the family. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 4, the Bible says, But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite, which means to pay back their parents, for this is good and acceptable unto God, before God. If any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home. Let those children learn to show piety at home to pay back or to requite their parents. John Gill commented on this and said, For all the sorrow, pain, trouble, care, and expenses they have been at in bearing and bringing them forth into the world, in taking care of them in their infancy, in bringing them up, giving them an education, providing food and raiment for them, and settling them in the world. Wherefore, to neglect them in old age when incapable of providing for themselves would be a base ingratitude, whereas to take care of them is but a requital, a requital of them, or a repaying them. For former benefits had of them. That's John Gill. He pastored in, in the British Isles about 200 years ago. You see, this passage of scripture tells families to do, and tells a pastor to teach the church family to do what Jesus is modeling on the cross. Teach the church family you need to pay back your parents. Your mom entered the jaws of death, as it were, giving you life. For years, you would have died had they not been there to take care of every physical need. Clean, cleansing your body, feeding your body, clothing your body, putting a roof over your head, educating you, preparing you for life. They spent all those years and all that money and all that energy serving you, taking care of you. Now that they're elderly, you pay them back. And then God even takes it a step further. He says in the same passage of scripture, if any provide not for his own, you don't provide for your own? You're, you don't take care of your elderly? If any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, your own parents, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Pretty strong words from God. After all your parents did for you, and now in their old age, you won't take care of them? You have denied any faith in God and you're worse than an unbeliever. That you could be so crash and callous as to refuse to take care of your parents when they need you. Now that was written to a pastor to pass on to a church family to teach them a God-given responsibility that God expects every family to live by. And that Jesus Christ is modeling as he hangs on the cross of Calvary. Now I realize that there are times where because of physical situations, a person needs care that can't be provided for in an individual person's home. And they need medical care that goes beyond what an individual family member can provide. That, no one's debating that. And you know something I could I could bring I could bring across this platform a number of members of CBC spanning back 26 years that could testify of what a joy it was to take care of their parents in their elderly years who sacrificed as kids who sacrificed and made sure their parents were taken care of when their parents needed them so desperately in their elder years. Anything short of that. By the way, to do that ought not to be so praiseworthy. It should be a, well, duh, what do you expect? It's what God told us to do. 
fulfilling that instruction shouldn't be so praiseworthy. But it's so often neglected today that it has become praiseworthy for those who will do what God tells them to do. But to not do that brings the condemnation of God worse than an unbeliever. You've denied your faith. And so Jesus Christ looked down at his mom. Jesus is the eldest son. Not the only son. Mary had a number of children after Jesus was born. She had, Jesus had four brothers that Mary bore. Four brothers. We know their names are given to us in the book of Matthew. Four brothers. And we don't know the names of the sisters, but multiple sisters. Mary had a lot of kids after Jesus was born. Jesus was the eldest. He took that responsibility seriously. He knows he's not going to be here. He looks down and sees his mom. The fact that his mom's not going to be taken care of by her husband Joseph indicates to us that Joseph was probably gone. He probably died. He's never mentioned in the Bible after Jesus' 12th birthday. He probably died. The fact that Jesus didn't just tell one of his brothers, hey, you guys, you, you four brothers, you all take care of mom. The Bible tells us that the brothers were unbelievers. They didn't believe in Jesus Christ until after the resurrection, after the crucifixion and resurrection. Then they're in the company of the believers. They got saved as a result of their brother's crucifixion and resurrection. But at this point in Jesus' life, as he hangs on the cross in death, he looks down at his mom and I have to assume that he felt in his heart that the best place for her was not with one of his brothers who were unbelievers. But would be to be in the home of one of the apostles, the apostle John. So he looked down. He says, Mom, you go home with John. John will be your son from now on. John, you take mom home. She'll be your mom from now on. And Jesus took care of his last earthly family responsibility before he died. Some might venture to say, you know, preacher, I would perhaps do something like that, but you don't know the situation I'm in. Tell that to Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. Jesus was in a pretty rough situation. And yet he made sure he took care of his family responsibility. After Jesus Christ had taken care of his final family responsibility, the earth grew quiet and dark as the sun refused to shine. And for three hours, Jesus Christ gasped for every breath, pushed up with his feet to relieve the pain in his hands and arms and shoulders to get his lungs in a position where he could inhale and gasp a breath and then sink back down and take the pressure off his feet and hang from his hands and then when he when he needed another gasp of air to push up to get one more gasp of air for three hours Jesus Christ hung in the blackness of night. And after three hours. A cry came shrieking out from the cross. My God. My God. Why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me alone? And Jesus Christ cried out in an agonizing loneliness on the cross. Because for the first time in eternity, he was abandoned by his own father. Why? We begin to understand the Garden of Gethsemane now. The garden 
where there was a Gethsemane, an olive press, that with great weight and pressure crushed the olives to release the oil from the olive. And there in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was anticipating this moment when for three hours, the weight of Mike Elstock's sin would crush the very life out of Jesus Christ. And he would be abandoned by God the Father. Why? Why? The only answer to that question is because he had become me. He who knew no sin became sin. He became you. And while he was you, God the Father abandoned him. And he felt the weight of your sin crushing the very life's blood out of him, leaving him alone, forsaken, and abandoned. What can explain such a wretched cry? The severity of hell can explain such a wretched cry. He's suffering my hell for me. Abandonment from God. To be abandoned from God for all of eternity. He's suffering my eternal hell. As he experiences the abandonment of his own father. The severity of hell explains why. The wrath of God explains why. Because God judges Sin. And the love of God. The love of Jesus Christ explains. Why Jesus was willing to stay on the cross. Because he loved me so much. He would drink. The last dregs. Of the cup. Of the wrath of God. Against my sin. He would drink it all for me. Why? And then immediately he cried out. John 19, 28 records it. He cried out, I am so thirsty. He's now exhausted. Physically, he is spent. It's all gone. The energy, the strength is gone. He is so exhausted. He cries out, I am so thirsty. I'm emaciated. I'm exhausted. Because of bearing the judgment of God for Mike Elstock's sin. And then, John 19.30, Jesus Christ said, It is finished. The work is done. Sin has been atoned for. Mike Elstock's sin has been, has been atoned. What I came to the cross to accomplish is completed. It is finished. It's all done. And then. Luke 23 records the last statement. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Father, I'm coming. And his head dropped. And he gave up the ghost. And he released his own life at the time that he chose. He released his own life from his body and was gone. The sayings of Jesus Christ on the cross... Begin and end with the issue of the salvation of people's souls. Only broken in the middle by the fulfillment of a family obligation to take care of his elderly mom before he dies. With that exception, everything else is about the salvation of sinners so they can have eternal life. God, would you hold back your wrath? Give them a little bit more time because they don't understand. You do understand? Today with me in paradise. Why? Why have I been abandoned? I'm exhausted. 
It's done. I'm coming home. Are you saved? Do you know there was a time in your life where you realized just how bad you are in God's eyes? How sinful you are? Did you feel the guilt of your sin? And did somebody share with you the amazing story of how much Jesus Christ loves you? And when you realized how much Jesus Christ loved you, did you call out like the thief on the cross did and embrace Jesus Christ, inviting him into your life? You see, religion will never get you to heaven. Baptism will never get you to heaven. Ceremonies will never get you to heaven. Preachers will never get you to heaven. Churches will never get you to heaven. Organized religion will never get you to heaven. The only thing that gets a person to heaven is for that person to come face to face with a holy God and deal with that God about their own sinfulness. And when we come to God with a broken heart and invite Jesus Christ to come into our life, He washes our sin away, welcomes us to His paradise because he paid it all on the cross of Calvary. Are you saved? Thank you for joining us for part of a Sunday service at Community Baptist Church. I hope to meet you soon. May God impress his love upon your heart this week.